Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Following fireworks in their courtroom, lawyers for the Parkland school shooter argue that their client will not receive a fair trial as they file a motion to have the judge removed from the case and argue over evidence. And a California woman is sentenced after faking her own kidnapping and pleading guilty to related charges. Will Sherry Papini be given jail time? Plus... You said he got hit the side. Well, he got hit the side with what? That's him. Well, he got shot. How many people, sir, how many people are hurt? I don't know. Atlanta police released 911 calls of a shooting that led to the arrest of Ludacris's longtime manager, Shaka Zulu, as he's now charged with murder. Then later, the Pike County Massacre. Is there anything remarkable or anything that stood out to you? Two things uh, stood out to me. One is it appeared as though there was forced entry. And the second thing is there appeared to be a transfer, a small transfer of blood. Testimony continues into its second week in the trial of George Wagner IV over his role in the 2016 murders of the Rodin family. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. Defense attorneys for the Parkland school shooter moved to get Judge Elizabeth Schreer taken off the case following last week's outburst against them in court. The new filing came just days before the defendant was set to appear in court Monday for a hearing over a separate matter about the admissibility of evidence, including hand-etched swastikas on a firearm, backpack, and boot, as well as hate speech and racial slurs on the defendant's social media. This all stems from the February 2017 shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, where a then 19-year-old gunman shot and killed 17 and injured 17 others. The shooter later pled guilty to 17 counts of murder and 17 more counts of attempted murder. The question of admissibility of certain pieces of evidence has been an issue since the beginning of court proceedings. The defense has fought against admitting evidence containing Nazi symbols, saying the drawings violate the Parkland shooter's right to a fair trial. The motion to dismiss the judge wasn't discussed on Monday, but she denied the request instead in a short written order. The motion came after Wednesday's outburst from the judge in court. I just want to say this is the most uncalled for, unprofessional way to try a case. You, you all knew about this, and even if you didn't make your decision till this morning, to have 22 people plus all of this staff and every attorney march into court, be waiting as if it's some kind of game, now I have to send them home. The state's not ready. They're not going to have a witness ready. We have another day wasted. I, I just, I honestly, I have never experienced a level of unprofessionalism in my career. It, it's unbelievable. I have been practicing in this county for 20 years. Uh, you know what, I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to well, hear it. Well, Judge, you're insulting me on the record in front of my client, and I believe that I should be able to Okay, you can do that later. You can put, make your record later. But you've been insulting me the entire trial. So blatantly taking your headphones off, arguing with me, um, storming out, coming late intentionally if you don't like my rulings. So, quite frankly, this has been long overdue. In the hearing Monday, prosecutors argue the defense opened the door for the swastika evidence to be shown to the jury. The defense knew what records they were admitting. They made the strategic decision not to question the jury about swastikas or hate speech. They cannot now come to this court and complain or blame the state when they were in control of the evidence that they were going to admit. They had the opportunity to pick and choose their evidence the same way they had the opportunity to pick and choose what to talk to the jury about. So now based on the fact that those records are in evidence and that documentation regarding the swastika and the racial slurs there, any prejudice has now evaporated. And it's, it's in evidence. And they, 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 there were plenty of records. They didn't have to admit those records. They could have chose bits and pieces, but they didn't. They put them in evidence. They opened the door, and now the state is going to march through. Joining us today is the state attorney for Palm Beach County, Dave Ehrenberg, and co-host Terry Austin. Dave, did the judge's actions cross a line in a way that she should recuse herself? I don't think so, Brian, and the courts are clear that a judge's expressions of frustration and exasperation with counsel are not enough to bounce that judge off of a trial. And I think what's really going on here is that the defense counsel want to preserve this issue for appeal. They're going to go after the judge on appeal in the hopes of overturning any death penalty conviction here. And 
So that's what they're doing because they know that she's not going to recuse herself. If she did, that would cause such a huge delay in this trial. They have to do the whole thing all over again. And she'd essentially have to admit that she was biased. So that's not going to happen. This is an appellate move. And also one more thing, Brian, they may be playing for the next call. That's what you do in a sports game. You know, you yell at the referees not to get the last call reversed. You're hoping to change the call that comes next. So I don't think this is going to have any immediate impact on the case. Yeah, I'll see what that next call is and see if that uh, gamble works out for them. Terry, should the racial slurs and swastikas come in, especially where he uses the N-word but doesn't target any people of color or black or African-American? Oh, I definitely think those swastikas should come in. It has been already opened as far as the prosecution said. The defense opened that door and they're marching right in. It's relevant. It demonstrates motive. And also, it's more probative than prejudicial. Remember, the defense has raised this over and over. And the judge has said, I will reserve. I will wait to see what happens. I will wait to see what evidence comes in. And I think the defense thinks it's highly prejudicial. But the judge actually said, why is this more prejudicial than other comments, other pejorative comments? And so I think she's right. It should all come in. Yeah. Today's point, this could be the next ruling by the, by the referee and see how they'll decide on this one because it'd be major for both sides. Well, in California, testimony resumes but gets a late start Monday in the 1996 case of the disappearance of Kristen Smart as father and son Paul and Ruben Flores stand trial for her murder 26 years later. Smart was a Cal Poly student who went missing after a party in May of 1996, but the case went cold for two decades with very few leads. Paul and Ruben Flores were long suspected in her disappearance and were arrested just last year. Witnesses say Paul was the last person seen with Smart. He is charged with her murder. His father, Ruben, is charged with accessory after the fact. Prosecutors say he helped hide the body and is accused of burying her in his backyard and later moving her remains. Smart's body has never been found. On the stand Monday was a forensic DNA analyst, an expert in bodily fluids, who's worked on several cold cases. While explaining her background for the jury, she testified she's handled hundreds of cases over the last 20 years. Testimony expected to last through at least October, and despite several delays, including four days off last week, the judge says they're right on schedule. And in Maryland, a man found guilty of murder 22 years ago has his conviction overturned. This comes after a joint request from the defense and prosecutors. Anand Syed's case rose to fame in 2014 when the podcast Serial broke listening records. The investigative series cast doubt on his 2000 conviction for the 1999 murder of his high school girlfriend, 18-year-old Hei Ming Lee. He has been behind bars since his 1999 arrest, and since then, Syed has maintained his innocence. In the latest filing, prosecutors called for Syed to be freed over new information about two alternate suspects. The two were known to investigators, but were not properly ruled out or disclosed to the defense. And they had serious charges on their criminal records, including serial rape and sexual assault. On Monday, the judge overturned Syed's conviction and released him under home detention. The judge also ordered a new trial. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, California woman Sherry Papini is sentenced in federal court after pleading guilty to charges related to a 2016 kidnapping hoax. But first, Atlanta music executive and longtime manager of hip-hop artist Ludacris, Shaka Zulu is facing murder charges after a shooting earlier this year resulted in a man's death. Welcome back. California mother of two, Sherry Papini, is sentenced in federal court Monday following a kidnapping hoax which garnered national attention. Back in April, Papini pled guilty to two counts of mail fraud and lying to an officer after a November 2016 incident when Papini allegedly went missing. 22 days later, she was found on an interstate about 150 miles south of where she was reported missing. Papini claimed two Hispanic women in a dark SUV abducted and tortured her. But her ex-boyfriend told investigators Papini actually stayed with him during the time she was missing and that she inflicted injuries, including branding, to herself. Papini was married with two children at the time. According to court documents, Papini will pay more than $300,000 in restitution to the agencies involved in her search. Prosecutors recommended eight months behind bars. On Monday, she was sentenced to 18 months in jail, followed by three years of supervised release. 
Terry, between the jail time, the, the supervision and restitution, do you think this is the right punishment and that it will deter others from doing the same? It's absolutely the right punishment, and hopefully it will deter others from doing something similar. Listen, the prosecutors, as you mentioned, they only asked for eight months, and defense asked for one. You normally see that. But here, the judge sentenced her to 18 months in prison. I definitely think they're trying to send a message. It's more than twice as much as the prosecution requested. And then 36 months of survive, you know, supervised release, that's a long time. So I think it may seem unusually harsh, and it is, but these are serious crimes. You lie to the FBI, and you commit mail fraud, you mislead the public, you spend a lot of money. And I think the restitution part of this is important, too, because it shows, look, you might waste our time and our money, but you're going to pay back. Yeah. Now, Dave, the prosecution pushed back on the defense's request for just one month in jail, arguing the public harm Papini created. What harm do you see that she created, if any? A lot. And Terry's right. I agree with the sentence. And there's a number of different types of harms. First, she accused two Hispanic women of abducting her. So you have that thrown out into the universe, uh, the, the racism there, and that's pretty awful. But also all the hours of legwork that law enforcement spent on this case that were diverted from other cases. And so you want to try to send a message that we should never have uh, misused the system and people should never do what she did. Um, also, you know, when she was given a chance to cop to this, when the investigators came to her and said, hey, your ex-boyfriend is saying this, uh, your boyfriend is saying this, and you want to admit to it now? Well, she denied it again. So the lie continued way past the time it should have ended. Exactly. We'll see. Well, that seems to be the end of the Papini saga. 18 months in jail, restitution, and three years of supervised release. Thank you both. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a high-profile Atlantic music executive is facing murder charges after Shaka Zulu was involved in a shooting at a restaurant which left three people shot and one man killed. Plus, testimony from law enforcement agents describes processing the many crime scenes in the trial of Pike County Massacre defendant George Wagner IV. Welcome back. We head to Georgia as music executive and longtime manager of hip-hop artist Ludacris. Shaka Zulu is charged with murder over a shooting in an Atlanta strip mall parking lot earlier this year. Zulu was one of three men shot in the June 26th shooting and nearly died himself, according to his attorneys. Officers arrived at the scene around 11.30 that night to find the three men with gunshot wounds. Artez Benton died of his injuries after being taken to the hospital. Investigators later identified Zulu as a suspect, charging him with murder, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm during a crime, and simple battery. Zulu turned himself in to authorities and was released the same day after posting a $200,000 bond. His attorneys say he fired his weapon in self-defense after being attacked by at least four men. They say he was shot in the back and nearly lost his life and that he is still recovering from his injuries. Zulu has been representing Ludacris since the 1990s and has been more recently served as head of artist and talent for the music streaming service Spotify. Officials only recently released three 911 calls from the night of the shooting. I need, I need an officer at m right now at apartment 4B. I have... Can I have the address? Yeah, gentlemen, he's down. Sir, I need the address. I don't address. know the address. I don't, I don't know the address. I'm at a restaurant. It's called apartment 4B. I have it's a gentleman who's down. Okay, listen, 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 listen. I need you to tell me where you are first. I'm going to get all the information. I'm at a restaurant. I'm at a restaurant. It's called Apartment 4B. He got hit in the side. Listen to me, stop. Yes. Can you hear me? Stop it. Can you hear me? Just breathe. He's breathing. He has his eyes closed. I'm trying to keep him as calm as possible. Okay, I understand. There's a lot of okay, Listen to me. I understand that he has his eyes closed, but is he conscious? Yeah, yeah he's breathing. He, just, he has his eyes open. He's breathing. Is he alert? Shot. Look at me, Shot. Look at me, Shot. Look at me, Shaw. Open your eyes. Yes, he can open his eyes. He's with me now. Okay, is he responding appropriately? Yes. Shaw, he's just taking his time and he's breathing real calm. Terry, $200,000 bond on a murder sounds pretty low. Could that be an indication that the prosecution's case isn't that strong? You know what, Brian, I agree, it is relatively low, but based on the reports that we've heard so far, I think the case against him does not sound overwhelming.
First of all, he was shot in the back. It doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't the aggressor, but it does indicate to me that he was caught off guard. And he is claiming self-defense. He's saying that these four men came up upon him. And he said he returned the fire, or at least the reports are, to defend his life. He had a weapon, but it was a licensed weapon, and he turned himself in, and he's a longtime executive. I think for all of those reasons, the bail was set at a relatively low amount because he can be trusted, he'll come back to court, and he himself almost died. So for, for those reasons, I do think it made sense. Yeah, I think the licensed weapon really saved him in that, in that situation. Dave, three men found at a scene, all shot, one dies. You're the state attorney in Palm Beach. How does a prosecutor figure out who to charge? Oh, it's a tough one. You got to talk to witnesses. You got to get the surveillance video and you got to make the decision as to who was the initial aggressor and who uses disproportionate force. I agree with Terry. This is going to be a tough one because of his lack of criminal record, his uh, position as an executive, the fact that he was shot in the back and the fact that he turned himself in. And so you can tell that the prosecution doesn't think it's that strong of a case already because of the low bond. Yeah, just to give an example, when I'm practicing in, in Brooklyn, you could see a quarter million dollar bond for an attempted murder. So when I see $200,000 on a murder, that to me kind of raises my public defender ears to say, maybe the defense has something here. But of course, we'll keep eyes on this case as it continues. When we come back, Ohio's Pike County massacre trial stretches into a second week. As George Wagner IV is tried for murder, and jurors hear testimony from those who process one of the many crime scenes. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily Testimony in the Pike County Massacre stretches into its second week as George Wagner IV stands trial for his role in the 2016 shooting deaths of eight members of the Rodin and Gilly families. Wagner, along with his brother Jake and their parents Billy and Angela, were all charged for their involvement in the shooting deaths of the Rodin and Gilly families in April of 2016. The murders allegedly came amid an ugly custody dispute involving a young child Jake shared with Hannah Rodin. The victims were found shot to death in their homes. Most were shot as they slept. Jake previously pled guilty to the murders and will spend the rest of his life in prison. He's agreed to testify against his brother and father. Angela has also pled guilty and is expected to testify at George's trial. George's defense argued he's not guilty because he didn't actually pull the trigger. On Monday morning, testimony continued from Bureau of Criminal Investigation agent Shane Hanshaw. He testified that none of the evidence collected at the crime scene where Chris and Gary Roden's bodies were found contained DNA linked to any of the defendants in this case. He told the jury, however, there were signs of forced entry at a structure on the same property. At some point you said you had noticed security cameras on this building. When you were up in that area, did you notice a security camera uh, in that vicinity? Yes. Exhibit A114, you can see the top portion of the door, and above that is a camera mounted there. We thought it appeared as though it, it were pointing toward the residence. We attempted to look for any kind of re recording device that would have maybe documented what happened or given us some idea. Uh, we traced the wires back, they led inside, and uh, we found nothing, no recording device. Before going into that, that room, did you examine that door um, a little more further for other evidence or the possibility of evidence? Yes. And as you looked at that door, was there anything remarkable or anything that stood out to you? Two things uh, stood out to me. One is it appeared as though there was forced entry, uh, which would be consistent with the uh, door handle lying on the, the upper surface of the porch. And the second thing is there appeared to be a transfer, a small transfer of blood on the exterior face of that door. All right, so Dave, we heard it just there. Signs of forced entry, but that happened away from where the bodies were found. So does that create any kind of reasonable doubt as to who actually committed these murders? Perhaps, but there are uh, other counts where you don't have to actually show this guy as the direct murderer to get him a serious sentence. And also, the biggest evidence for me is that his own mother and brother are testifying against him. I've never heard of someone's mother testifying against him. That should be enough. This is a horrific tragedy that happened. And I think the fact that all these other people have been convicted for the same crime means this guy's going down too. just a question of which of the serious crimes he will be found guilty of.
Yeah, we often call something like this a, a long plea negotiation because eventually something, he might be found guilty of something. Uh, Terry, BCI agent Hanshaw testified and the party stipulated that there was no DNA for George, Jake, Angela, or even Billy Wagner at the scene where, what, where uh, Chris and Gary Roden were found. What could that mean? You know, that scene one didn't find any DNA from any of the Wagners. And at first you might think and that's a problem as far as the prosecution's concerned. But I don't think it is. I think the prosecution was very good when they questioned BCI agent Henshaw because he made clear that if you wore gloves, then there would be no DNA transfer. He didn't go so far as to say, well, can we say that the Wagners were wearing gloves? But he made it clear that that is a possibility. And if, in fact, they were wearing gloves, what that means is this was cold, it was calculated, it was premeditated. And David's exactly right. Your mother is testifying against you. That's plenty of evidence for this jury to say the Wagners were there at that scene. Whether or not there was DNA, they were very careful to make sure. There was no DNA. Still guilty. All right. Don't commit crimes. Be kind to your mother. You never know what she'll testify to. Well, thank you both. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.